Welcome back. In this video, we look at logistic regression, a supervised classification algorithm. In linear regression, the target was quantitative. In logistic regression and all other classification algorithms, the target is qualitative. We can have binary classification, where we classify into one of two classes, or we can have multi-class classification. Linear models for classification create decision boundaries to separate the observations into regions in which most observations are of the same class. The decision boundary is a linear combination of the predictors. Here we see a visualization of a linear decision boundary between two classes with one misclassified observation. Let's look at logistic regression in our studio. This notebook uses the Plasma dataset in the package. The package is loaded with library. Recall that if you don't have the package installed, you can install it at the console with install.packages. After the package is loaded, the Plasma dataset is attached. The advantage of attaching a dataset is that you can just reference the variables directly instead of having to use the dollar notation. The disadvantage of attaching is that you can have name collision when importing multiple datasets. Looking at the structure, we see that it's a tiny dataset of only 32 rows and 3 variables. Reading the documentation, we see that the ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate, has two classes, either greater than or less than 20 millimeters per hour. This sedimentation rate could be an indication of certain diseases. There are two predictors, fibrotinogen and globulin, both representing plasma proteins in the blood. Here's a look at the first few rows. First, let's look at box plots of the two predictors. We have var width set to true, and we see that there are more observations with ESR below 20 than above. It looks like fibrinogen levels over a certain amount are more associated with ESR over 20. That's less clear with the globulin. Let's look at conditional density plots. These give us similar information but in a different way. The total probability space is the rectangle with the darker gray indicating ESR values over 20. You can visualize where the fibrinogen level reaches a critical point associated with higher ESR. And again, that's a little less clear with the globulin levels. Even though our data is tiny, we go ahead and divide it into train and test sets. That leaves us just 24 observations for training and 8 for test. This data is too small to reliably learn anything from. I'm just using it for illustration purposes. And this data set has another problem. It's unbalanced. If I plot the ESR column, I see that many more observations have a low value compared to high value. Next, we build a logistic regression model with the GLM generalized linear model method. We're predicting ESR as a function of fibrinogen alone on just the training data. The family equal binomial parameter is needed because we're classifying two classes. The summary is a little bit different for logistic regression compared to linear regression. The residuals are deviance residuals, measures of deviance contributed from each observation. The coefficients represent changes in the log odds of y. We'll talk more about that later. And the model metrics are different. Again, we don't care about the intercept. It's just used to fit the model. The coefficient fibrinogen has a p-value here of dot, which is OK, but not great. At the bottom, we see null deviance and residual deviance. What you want to see is a decrease from the null deviance to the residual deviance. The null deviance is the deviance just using the intercept alone. 
So if the predictors actually have value, you'll see a drop from null deviance to residual deviance. AIC is the Akia K information criterion. It's useful for comparing models, so it doesn't have a lot of meaning to us in isolation here. For this metric, the minimum value is better, and it penalizes more complex models. There's a formula for AIC in the book, but I'll just mention that it uses the number of parameters in the model and the maximum likelihood. Logistic regression in R goes through an iterative optimization process. It's a newton raphson algorithm, and in this case it went through five iterations. Now let's evaluate on the test set. The predict function is using type equals response, which will output probabilities. We can see the probabilities over here in our environment, and these will be values between 0 and 1. We use an if-else to convert the probabilities to the 1-2 levels of our target. We're choosing 0.5 as the cutoff point. Probability greater than 0.5 will be classified as 2. Probability less than or equal to will be 1. And you can see again over here in our predictions that, the, that they're all 1. Then we print out our accuracy, which was 0.75. It turns out we were wrong for two of the eight cases. In data this small, we shouldn't expect any algorithm to learn very well, but I like to use a small data set when explaining a new algorithm. If you have a small data set that you really do need to learn from, you can use random sampling of the data using techniques like cross-validation, which we'll discuss later in the course. What this table shows you is that the values which were predicted to be 1, and really were 1, is 6. But we had two values predicted to be 1, which were actually class 2. Earlier I mentioned that the coefficient in logistic regression represents a change in the log odds of y for every one unit change in the predictor. What does that mean? The log odds is simply the log of the odds. Let's review what we mean by odds versus probability. If you play a game and win 7 games and lose 3, then the odds is simply the ratio of the wins to the losses. If we express the same data as a probability, then we have the number of wins over the total number of games, which is going to scale between 0 and 1. We can convert from odds to probability with this formula. Here I'm extracting the fibrinogen coefficient and the intercept. I'll make a sequence and compute the log odds with the coefficient and intercept. Notice the log odds is linear. We can convert log odds to probability with this formula. Notice the S shape in the probabilities. Now let's build another model, this time modeling ESR as a factor of both fibrinogen and globulin. The accuracy did not improve. Comparing the summary of model 2 versus the summary of model 1 over here on the right, we see that our coefficients changed for fibrinogen, and we didn't get a very good p-value for globulin, but it still made the overall model better. For example, our null deviance went from 21 down to 12, including globulin, compared to 21 down to 15 when we didn't. Also, the AIC is lower for the second model, indicating that it is a better model. We can do an analysis of variance between these two models. We see that even though the residual deviance did go down from one model to the other, this indicates over here that it's not considered statistically significant. In linear regression, the output is a real numbered value that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. That won't help us in classification. What we need is a function that will scale the output to the range 0, 1 for probabilities. The sigmoid or logistic function will do that for us. The sigmoid function has this S-shaped curve. The way we use this for classification is to define some cutoff point 
usually at the inflection point of the S curve, which is 0 0.5. And any values above that we classify as the positive class. Any values below that we classify as the negative class. When we looked at logistic regression in R, we were outputting log odds, not probability. Why not just go ahead and model probability? The reason is that log odds can range from negative infinity to positive infinity, while probability is restricted from 0 to 1. This restriction would reduce the accuracy of the model. Also, it wouldn't be linear in the predictors. The log odds is a linear combination of the predictors. If we solve for p, the probability, we get the logistic function. Recall the loss function for linear regression. If we plug in the logistic function for f of x, it wouldn't be a convex function and would be difficult to solve. To find a suitable loss function, we start with the likelihood. Notice in this equation that one of the terms is always 1, so that when they're multiplied, one term disappears. Let's say that y equals 0 then this term becomes 1. On the other hand, if y equals 1, then the other term becomes 1. If we take the log of this for mathematical simplicity, notice that we're adding now instead of multiplying. Now one of these terms will go to 0 for either y equals 0 or y equals 1. In training the classifier, we want to penalize it for wrong classifications. Notice that if we put the two portions of our loss function together, it becomes a convex function, which we can solve with optimization methods. Next, we look at using multiple predictors on the Titanic dataset. We'll read in the CSV, which is available in the GitHub, and we see it has 1309 rows and 14 variables. We don't want to use all those variables, so the first thing we'll do is subset the data. We'll subset the data down to just passenger class, survived, sex, and age, converting class, survived, and sex to factors. Using the contrast function, we see that female is 0 and male is 1. Survived is 0 or 1. 0 means they did not survive, and 1 means they did survive. Passenger class will need a couple of dummy variables. The base case is passenger class 1, and we need a variable or an extra column to indicate class 2 or class 3. Passenger class, survived, and sex don't have any NAs, but age has 263. What we do is replace all of those values that are NA for the age column with the median of the age. Having to replace so many NAs is going to really dilute the predictive power of the age column. Next, we divide our data into train and test sets. We see that we'll have 981 train observations and 321 test observations. Then we build the logistic regression model, modeling survived as a factor of all other predictors, which in this case are just three. Notice we have the dummy variables for passenger class two and three. So relative to passenger class zero, the base case, we get negative coefficients, meaning a decrease in the log odds of survival for those classes. Likewise, we have a dummy variable for male, indicating a decrease in the log likelihood of survival if you're male. Notice that all these predictors got good results, and that our null deviance went down from 1305 to about 900. Now let's evaluate on the test data. We see that our accuracy was about 76.5%. When we print our table like this, it's sometimes called a confusion matrix. And what we want to see is most of the numbers up here on this diagonal right here. So these values here, the 164, are the true positive, considering 0 not survived as the positive class, although that's a not very positive outcome. So for what we predicted, we predicted 164 in the positive class that actually were, 
but we also predicted 38 in the positive class that weren't. Those are the false positives. Down here we predicted that 87 people would survive and they really did, but also predicted 39 people would survive that did not. Those are the false negatives. To output the confusion matrix up here, we used the built-in table function where one argument was the predictions and the other argument was the true values. To compute the accuracy, we just took the average of the number of times that the predicted value equaled the true value. Here I've extracted the table into T so I could extract true positives, false positives, false negatives, and true negatives. Accuracy will be the diagonals, true positive plus true negative, divided by all of the numbers. And we see that is our accuracy here. Sometimes people also report their error rate, which is simply 1 minus the accuracy. So our error rate was 0.23. Here in the console, I've also calculated two additional metrics. Sensitivity measures the true positive rate. Of true cases, how many did you get right? Specificity, also called recall, measures the true negative rate. Of those that were of the negative class, how many did you identify? If we compare over here our sensitivity and our specificity, we see that we did a much better job classifying with one class than the other one. I computed these metrics manually so you could see what they mean. The caret package, loaded here, gives us this information and much more using its confusion matrix method. Notice I needed to convert my predictions into factors. This is the output of confusion matrix. Notice it considered positive class 0, the not survived. You can change that with a parameter if you wanted it to go the other way. Notice it got the same accuracy we did and the same confusion matrix. Also the same sensitivity and specificity, along with other metrics. One of those other metrics is the kappa value. I have the formula for kappa in the book. The kappa statistic tries to adjust for the likelihood that you guessed right by chance. It takes into consideration the distribution of classes. A kappa of 0.5 is moderately good. Values closer to 1 are considered better, but very hard to get with this metric. Another metric we can use is the ROCR, Receiver Operating Characteristics. The term comes from World War II, used in detecting true signals in sonar versus false alarms. The ROC curve shows the trade-off between predicting true positives while avoiding false positives. The y-axis is the true positive rate, and the x-axis is the false positive rate. What we want to see is this curve shoot up as far as possible into this upper left corner. In the predict up here, we extract a probability of each class. The ROC function will sort by the estimated probability of the positive class. Each individual observation will cause the line either to go up or to the right. If you see a perfectly diagonal line, that would mean the classifier had no predictive value. A related metric is AUC, area under the curve, which is the area under the ROC curve. Values range from 0.5 to 1.0, 0. 0.5 meaning a classifier with no predictive value, that would have been a diagonal line, and 1.0 for a perfect classifier. So here we get 0. 0.805. We've covered a lot of ground in logistic regression. In the next video, we'll continue our discussion. <laughs>